here with Matt Smith. So I guess first we got to cover all that, you know, that background shit that people seem to care about. Where did you grow up? I grew up on the north side of Sydney at a little suburb called Belrose, up near Francis Forest, Terry Hills. My parents have lived there for 54 years in the same red brick house, you know, next to a park in a cul-de-sac. I was there till I was probably 21. After I finished, I went to Catholic schools and semi, oh, like a private school called St. Pius, which the 10th, which in Chatswood, which is terrible. I hated it. Thankfully, there was a guy there called Brother Mac and he was an artist. And actually, he influenced a lot of really good artists actually had some musicians that came out of there so there was a bit of a culture of art but it was more rugby and mm. you know bullfeds and that sort of thing mm. and then after failing the hsc because i started surfing my brains out like i would surf so much eight hours a day anything i could do to get in that water was just so important to do the best cutback or re-entry or yeah. surf it or chasing that one little moment yeah just little tiny thing and creating art on a wave kind of thing Little did I realise that you're, yeah. you're kind of painting a wave. Yeah, incising patterns into the landscape. Yeah. It moves, it's not well, static like trust me, what we study now. It's amazing. Actually, you can see artists in the water. Some of them bash the shit out of it and, and destroy the wave, right? But there are artists that carve mm. through the wave and paint these beautiful sprays of paint of the foam mm. and they dip under the lip mm. and you just, you can really see it online when you watch them surfing. And that, there, there was a guy, Derek Hind, uh, he had one eye got poked out I think by a fin fin chop I'm not sure about that don't that's not fin chops are ruthless I believe that yeah I l almost lost a toe with a fin chop he he uh, performed on the big screen at the opera house while the Sydney Opera Orchestra played the music behind him oh, wow. and he his board had no fins and so he was just sort of carving over these beautiful waves and ripping apart and also not ripping it but just carving these beautiful turns and slow and working with the camera which was the way. I guess from after failing school, strangely enough, I ended up in the bank as a teller. Oh, really? Yeah. How, lo how long did you have? I think it was 98 you got into advertising. 88, sorry. How, mu how much time was there between leaving school and deciding that was what you wanted to do? After this year in the bank, and I realised I was shit at it. <laughs> like, every fucking time, I, I couldn't balance the books, right? I was a ledger and a teller. And How'd you get the job? Well, anyone could get a job in the bank right, back right. then. Like, probably even now. You fill in a form, you do a open day and you go. They'd, they'd take anyone. And the reason why I kind of liked it was you start early and then you finish early. Uh, if you balance the bloody books, which I... Well, <laughs> which... You know, I was always out by 10 or 20 cents or, and it used to drive the manager mad. By the end, they had me in the lunchroom doing the posters for uh, personal loans. 5%. Invest in us and we'll give you... Yeah, yeah. Term deposit. That's fascinating. And so I was drawing these little cartoon people having holidays and driving cars. And a friend of mine who'd just done Ramwick, Ramwick TAFE. He'd done the graphic design certificate there. And he said, actually, your drawings are really good. You should do this thing so we can stop hearing you whinge about your job. <laughs> In the surf, outside the surf, at the disco, at North City Leagues or down at DY watching bands, I'd whinge about working in the bank. <laughs> he said, I'll help you get in and... If you don't say another fucking word about Yeah, just that lose, the ba <laughs> lose the hate about what you do. This mate, Mark Gravis, who was an animator friend of mine, excellent, amazing. He knew what he wanted to do from day one. He wanted to be an animator. He is amazing and he's all about animation and he influenced me so much. Even the way I dress, even the music I listen to. He was the most probably influential person in my life at that stage. I don't know how he became so wise in the world of music and that sort of thing and knowing what he wanted to do, but he just seemed to know more than any of the other kids. And because when you grow up in 
the burbs, you're only a kid still. In suburban white bread Australia, it was easy back in oh. the 70s for lots of people. Everyone had a job, well, most people did. You kind of sheltered from it, and people have one job for the life. Yeah, they don't sort of... Everyone's not restless to look beyond what they've sort of accepted as their yeah. family unit but, and their place in the world, right? It's, that's right. They thought you get one job, one career, and you stick at it for from 17 or whenever you leave school till when you retire at say 56 by the time 56, you retire 56 then mm. or something like that I think dad got I mean that seems unfathomable now 56 56 I'm fucking retire. 53 <laughs> there is yeah. no way and you're gearing up for another fucking three decades of I'm ready to go yeah. actually <laughs> I've just sort of been on my roller coaster ride of life <laughs> and it's been really good but mm. the last couple of years have been shocking because I've had a marriage breakup after 24 years you know and I'm really proud of my two beautiful daughters uh, Moya and Marcella but breaking up with Mercedes was just so hardcore that I haven't quite recovered from it art has been such a great thing to, if, if you're going through turmoil and shit do art get it on some canvas get it on your paper think about how you're feeling and put it out because oh my god it's so leth- um, cathartic cathartic not lethargic <laughs> <laughs> no, like it's it's just so fucking cathartic yeah. that you can get it out. It, it sort of relieves mm. a lot of pain. And I mean, there's that when when you do creative things, you almost I feel like we do them because we almost can't comprehend how we're feeling. When you, when you make something, um, especially at the moment, do you ever have that moment where, or do you look back at an old work, kind of see things more clearly and think, "Fuck, I was really I was really feeling that then." And yeah, yeah. Sort well, of see it I think um, you mentioned some of the things before. Like I went through a stage where painting a lot of how I was feeling, and there's a lot oh, the, of with like the drowning motifs and yeah, falling and falling. um. And, but the reason I got into art was because I was doing a course that Mercedes bought me for a birthday present. I take heaps of drugs and alcohol, mm. and during this course, I was trying to paint. I think it was a still life or something. You know, really simple. And for just a minute, I fell into the paint. I lost myself in there and it was better than better than drugs drugs. it was it was really and i knew it was a lot healthier although those buddy terps are pretty toxic yeah i was i just fell into it and i loved it and was just like lost in it and i really enjoyed it and i went i need to get more of that buzz so it was really it was really a a bodily response or a cognitive response that made you think fuck well i need to give i need to give the arts a go as an artist i think um it was actually a dissatisfaction with advertising in a sense because you know during your career you are you have creative directors right they're in charge of you and at a certain point in your life and your experience you realize that what they are saying from your experience isn't the right thing and your career is sometimes dictated by their them so you might be coming up with world-class work Mm. that is amazing work and really amazing stuff that you know that might win awards Mm. in Cannes or in New York or in London because I've always done my advertising work on a global scale not on a Sydney suburban scale because Sydney's a tiny town that's a really conservative oh, mate, once town once you get out it's like oh fuck well with the internet the world is tiny yeah and you can see so many talented people out there mm. it's insane how many talented people are and how many people are doing art mm. whether it's good or bad it's therapeutic for everybody Every- yeah. and I, I imagine during COVID it must be going nuts I've, I've thought a lot about that and I hope, you know, I hope like things like this at least some way will promote people trying to, you know, fall into things where they create as opposed to consume, right? Yep. Where they're not gaming or, you know, looking at videos on Instagram, but they're, you know, starting up their own Instagrams and I they're think making I... their own, they're making their own destiny happen because I'm, I'm really glad you kind of talked about that because one kind of thing that was bugging me in kind of researching you was... The this idea in advertising that kind of is a good metaphor for you know our society at large and that so often our destiny is defined by higher powers be it a bank to get investment to start up your business or just to own a fucking bit of land do you have any you know what kind of steps did you have to take to kind of reclaim your individuality 
in that kind of time? Well, I've kind of been a bit on the... I don't know, I feel I've always been on the creative edge of advertising. And these days there's less and less characters and there's been some amazing, talented people that just don't conform to business. Because mm. it's a kind business. Systemically marginalised. Yeah, but like the, the thing about advertising and what creative people sometimes forget, and I often did, mm. um, is that it is art and commerce. You have to... Maybe art in the service of commerce. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. You can create art separately. Mm. If you get confused that it's about the art and not selling products, that can make you lose direction a bit. Mm. Because you th- you're told, oh, you have to be really creative. You have to win awards. You have to be the best. But when the client doesn't buy it or they're not on board with you winning Count Lion as opposed to selling I don't know, bread or ice cream or a car, you know, everyday items, how do you make those things sing, you know? I haven't done that since I was 18. That'll be on there. I'll go in there. I haven't done it for ages either. Yeah. It's always a bit sharp on the nostril. I don't know, man. I saw what fucking Stevie Nicks did to her nose. I was like, I don't even want to tempt that beast. Yeah. It's like... This, my computer used to be covered in that shit. Alright. Okay. Turn that down a bit more. Yeah. I decided to do graphic design as opposed to art school if I was to go back to my 19 year old mind in the bank going, oh God, I failed school so I can't be a teacher. Uh, which is ironic. And, and and I really need to earn money because I've had a taste of it by mm-hmm. being in the bank. And then I, I kind of go, uh, okay, well, graphic design. You know, two years, I can get out and hopefully get a job. And thankfully, I, I was able to. And I, I worked for a couple of years and then went overseas uh, for a, a couple of more years mm-hmm. where I lived in London. During their recession in 1990, uh, there was a recession that went through the world. There I am in London trying to be a, trying to get a job as a graphic designer. The question, the core of that question. Oh, the way the way we're pitching, you know, you know, education and yeah, university right, as right, a right. as an outcome instead of a process of finding ourselves. I think um, I think the beauty about art school, it, uh, the perspective I see, is that exactly that you find your creative self. And by chance, I've done a, a campaign for National Art School Open Day uh, when I was working at a company called Three Hundred Three Low. Now, is that the one you showed me the other day? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I was a fan of that. Yeah. Basically, what we did, we got a super talented photographer called Ingvar Ken and uh, uh, from the Pool Collective. And we got him to go out on the street and shoot li- shit. Shoot anything. Anything that looked like art, right? But maybe wasn't necessarily art. No, not Things at all. Things that aesthetically took your fancy. So he photographed everything from bird shit that looked like a Jackson Pollock. Uh, cigarette butts. You know, lots of people have the perspective that mm. art is a waste of time. And it's Australia, remember, and, and uh, Australia is so conservative, it's mm. just ridiculous. The thing that you can actually be successful in art, that you can have a career in art and survive without just being a dull bludger and a welfare drain just because you're an artist, has totally changed now. And the reason why is because of things like social media, because social media um, is, a, is an excellent way of getting your art out there. Mm. Like, more people see your art now than would ever be able to see your art. A lot of luck comes into it, but also if you're a... Well, it's safe to say neither of us would have really found our legs well, as artists without Instagram. I know we both right. use. That's a great I form. used to sell a lot of... Well, when I met you, right, I was still selling work on Instagram and... I thought that was um, amazing. Like, you already had a... Before you even been to art school, and I was just starting up in the studio with my delusional self-belief that I'm going to change my career and, you know, part of a, a crazy plan to... Um, um, to be an artist but delusional self-belief it's so integral to be delusional Matt but it's so you important you have 
because to me. Because those delusions, those delusions got got me into advertising. They got me. I don't mean they're not delusions anymore once but they're like, realised, are they? Like No, they let me work in London. They let me work in Auckland and Christchurch. Whilst everyone had grown at that, amazing life experiences. They helped me work in South Africa. I was there. Let's talk to you about that. I'll play a yeah. record and we'll keep yeah. back right there. Sure. I've got a question here that can, you know, I'll let you pick the record, but, you know, I wanted to ask, because you've worked extensively abroad. Um, quite a bit. Quite a bit. I mean, I, I, I read where you worked and it's crazy. Like, But I'm curious as to what musical or artistic tastes you might have picked up overseas. Like, I know you worked in France and America or cultural centres, but um, like you mentioned South Africa. Africa is a massive, massive influence on my musical craft. And as someone that now operates as an artist, very much locally in art making and teaching and whatever, where do global experiences sit with your practice and the way you look at things? Well, I love learning and I love, actually, uh, I don't know if you coined the phrase, but uh, a famous ad man called Paul Arden said, be a sponge. And by doing that, it's like absorb all your outside influences. Absorb everything so that when the brief comes along or when the conversation comes along or when someone asks you a question that is outside your realm, you'll have the answer or a version of it. Mm-hmm. You're, who doesn't like, whether it's whether you have to come up with an ad or a piece of art, who doesn't love having a fucking great conversation? And when you have somebody that can talk to you and have a bit of banter and you go, I get that, that's fun. Mm-hmm. It's fun to talk back and forth with somebody that knows what's going on and has absorbed everything from like my music taste uh, everything from reggae and dub I fucking love that stuff and the sound systems and the standing and dancing in front of those organ rearranging bass lines fuck I love that shit and then I will get off on like death metal or sludge metal and like feeling it feel you really feel music and suddenly you listen to bongos you know there's some famous South African bands Oh, mate. Oh, my God. Like, what, oh, what's it? Um, have you heard... Is it Lucky Dubai? Lucky Dubai it was fucking next level. I think absorbing everything like a sponge is mm. how you become an idea artist or an artist or a person. Mm. Well, I mean, like... Maybe just a person. From a scientist's perspective, too, a bit of what you're saying as well is kind of accepting you don't know everything, right? You got, you got but, to, you can but, only learn if you can accept that you... But our, uh, scientists are exceptionally creative because... Mm. If they, um, sure, they've got the technical mind, but if they don't loosen up and think laterally mm. and have lateral creative Higher thought, order thinking, yeah, yeah, and take some risks, they won't crack it. Mm. They'll just do what everybody else has already done, and yeah. th- and that's like the thing about artificial intelligence and the future, because all those jobs that we now hold in high esteem, like doctors, lawyers, all that sort of. Th- and politicians, mm. they don't have a lot of original creative ideas. The ones that saw in their fields will, yeah, and because they're creative as well. But when you know the world is robots, the only thing that uh, will be created by people will be from the art people. Consciousness, consciousness, maybe, but also I, I, people I could... that can come up with original ideas. Artificial intelligence, or where it learns off what's been done in the past, like that's what it's, it's been mm. done. The algorithms of what's been done, mm. but unique. Thought Fuck. Mm. Art- artists will rule the world in the future. I, I actually, think? <laughs> I reckon, I reckon, and and that's why politicians and the police. Yeah, you reckon they're scared. They're terrified of artists. I don't want to get a conspiracy I theory, think... but why was John Lennon assassinated? Why don't we know what happened to Kurt Cobain? Mm. What happened to Jimi Hendrix? Johnny Mitchell? Right. Oh, is it Johnny Mitchell? People? Yeah, all the amount of people that died at age twenty-seven. But, but like before, but they were gotta... also influencing the world. The world, mm. like that's how do you get like a, a global pandemic mm. of people just going wow? If their ideas can influence more people than a, a virus, wow. There's something we said. Music is like a vibe. Have we got a song for that? We need a song for that.
there's something to be said for a singer that really leans into a song that connects emotively rather than with good singing necessarily. Yeah, I think... Um, I mean, we were yeah. talking a bit about social commentary and that as, as an aesthetic with sound, do you think having that rawness is important? It's tapping into like basically uh human truth right somehow it sounds it, like a contradiction you know, no human like human truth well a human truth or a human feeling or if, if an idea is based on a human truth then it will connect right that's my firm belief yeah if you can make someone feel something because you know there's things that are you know you can't help but feel love for your child or if you see something terrible happen you get sad or angry or whatever mm. And most people have empathy, although it seems like less and less that's happening. I mean, I think we... Are we recording? Yeah, we're recording. It's fine. But we'll, I think we are kind of... A lot of people are being conditioned out of... Caring. Empath- empathetic impulses, right? Like, I we think... We should be allowed to care. Like, yeah. they, they say, oh, you know, you lefties, you you tree huggers. Oh, I fucking cop so much of that. Bro. Like, I I go, what? Well, when my religion's not the dollar, I walk a, te- a, you know, a fine line. You walk a tightrope, my friend. And I'm going to hell, probably. Because um, I try and walk both sides so it's funny like back so you effectively try and please well please ev- like you you want to please each well, discipline you're a part of is a, that what you're saying well i want to do the best of my creative abilities, powers or yeah. abilities to to do the best job i possibly can but i found myself in a couple of conundrums right where i found i needed the work and i got a freelance job where mm. it was promoting the I think Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister Joe Hockey oh, okay. Joe Hockey was the Treasurer right. and we did this campaign called the Challenge of Change where we utilised this document that comes out every year um, or every 20 years it's called the Internet Generational Change. Uh-huh. This document is created by the Treasury, right? Okay. And what it does, it looks into the future, 20 years into the future, mm. right? And it goes, okay, you know, uh, this is like probably five years ago when I did it, and we came out, came up with this idea, the challenge of change, right? Which we got everyday Australians to voice their opinions about change and its challenges, obviously. But in doing so, we it was propaganda to help push through a Some really sort of horrible budget. <laughs> right? Yes. I don't mean to laugh, but I, I actually just recall like a really specific point in time now that you're talking about yeah. when you said that it was that budget so it was that budget it was that budget it was oh, what do they call it altruism altruism altruism, yeah. altruism. it was harsh it was like and unnecessary and you're, and you're just and there for your paycheck i'm basically. there so i can feed my family that's as a freelance running the hairy banana when you do my, it and you're freelancing to be your own person too and now yeah you're, and you're suddenly back in the system I, i'm going oh fuck and i asked them can i not work on that can i work on everything else can you and they said just no. give me that one <laughs> you know and, that, and they said no you have to we want you for that because your experience you know how to do it you've done heaps of other campaigns for mm-hmm. the government and i went okay right okay i'll fuck so i was working on this propaganda and then on the weekend i was marching against <laughs> so i'm i'm in this on the streets i've got placards <laughs> no one would notice you either. i've got a a sign like um and, and actually they were really good signs because i've been working on this campaign it was like you know it's tony I'll, I'll, oh, so I'll give you, you some got like pictures. you got like twin campaigns going and you I had you twin getting paid for one and you're just rooting for the other yeah, guy yeah yeah that's awesome and do you know what people power won even though that campaign that the challenge of change was excellent and worked on by a bunch of really talented people who also mm. don't believe in that but have to do it for work have have and that's the thing about advertising you need to be able to work on cigarettes even if you don't believe in it you be working on um, tampons and you're a guy you know Mm. you need to adapt get into the shoes of the people that you're talking to Mm. and it's it's sometimes soul destroying and at the time it really did affect me but I've got some great signs with the put on Facebook a drawing of red speedos with a budgie um, and a sign uh, a voice bubble and I would get everyone to help me write the uh, headline. Oh yeah, throw it out. Yeah, throw out the caption. Yeah. yeah. So um, it ended up, you know, Tony Abbott, the budget smuggler. 
I think that was pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty fucking good. Yeah. And it, there's it, a whole bunch of signs that we do, and they're really, really good and poignant. I guess that's also the uh, advantage of an ad guy. You can do a good protest sign. And, and I'll show you some of those examples as well. Steps from a train going away. It always leaves me super intense. It's yeah, just, it's like it's very confrontational, isn't oh, it? Man, and it just freaks me out. Kind of to that was Justice's stress music video. I think to kind of to understand the sentiment, but have such disconnect to the action. That's what we're talking about um, when we say we have to try and put ourselves in other people's shoes. Mm, like back to this, this empathy this, thing. Also, we could never understand, because we've had a great life, even though we've had moments of stress and mental illness and whatnot, but you can't understand a lifetime of trauma through generations. Systemic, mm. systemic trauma, that, uh, being like racism, like being looked at differently. We've never experienced that. It's so impossible for us to put ourselves in that position. As much as we might want to try, there's no point trying. So what we have to do is believe what we hear mm. and believe the reasons why these people are feeling so fucked and angry. That just, oh man, it just gives me the mm. heebie-jeebies that people could be so angry. That they're reduced to that kind of state. Yeah, like, and, and that's the system. Mm. Like, yeah, they're not reacting to nothing, are they? They're not just bored and violent as a result, as you know, we're kind of sold a lot of the time. Well, it, there, there could be uh, like a lifetime of violence because mm. the countries they've come from are uh, Algeria, Middle East, you know, Africa. Yeah, you see a bit of that in Melbourne too. Like, Melbourne's a different kettle of fish to Sydney in terms of violence, right? And it's it's a, come completely from different. Yeah, they've come from, I mean, they're, they're warriors, man. They're like, warriors. Look at Sudan. Survivors. And... These are wars that often, you know, the West, as we're called, have initiated. Like, or turned a blind eye to and not tried to fix. I just think, how do you fix that shit? Education? You know, feed people. Like, the wealth of the world could feed these people. And they wouldn't have to fight for every fucking breath, every meal, every bit of respect. Because, like, you know, the wealth of the world could pay for that. Sure. I mean, with just a tiny bit of perspective, it all seems like common sense when you speak it aloud, doesn't it? It does. And, that's, and, and we should speak it aloud. Actually, that was something that was really interesting at the march or the protest on the weekend when they got this artist, Aboriginal guy. I think he had connections with Manila or Philippines or something like that. And he had this song, Say My Name, Say My Name. And what he asked us to do was say the names of the people that had died in custody. It was really poignant and really good because if you say their names, that's part of your, you know, George For Foreman? The guy that was just knelt on. Oh, George Floyd. I mean, that just made mockery of it. <laughs> it was... <laughs> Three. Like the guy, the guy with the grills and stuff. Yeah. No, no, no. I know. Oh. Yeah, I know what you're getting at. Oh, terrible. George Floyd. But if you say their name, you will remember them, and they become people as opposed to nothing. And with 438 deaths in custody, and no one's being held accountable for it, mm. holy fuck, what's wrong with the system? Say their name, and maybe create change. Use your, use your privilege to create change. Mm. I mean, like you, you, you arrive at things quite naturally in the struggle. When you come up with an idea, you have to explore. Some people don't believe in this theory, but I'm a firm believer that it's a numbers game. The more that you do, the more you will know which one is going to be the best idea. And the more you will understand that it is the best idea. How much does instinct play into that with you? When you when you know a good idea is a good idea. Well, because I consume images and ideas all day. Like I look online. I you know I'm on Insta. I'm on Facebook. I'm on the Guardian. I'm in newspapers. I'm looking at. So I, you're very tuned into what's happening. I around. walk around the streets. I look at things. I see the graffiti. I see. I am a sponge. I'm like looking at everything. I've actually taken that on board. Mm. I tell you what, going into nature was meant to be about medicine. Right? Was medicine for the soul or medicine is like a... To heal my fucked up head. Yeah, okay, so back to this catharsis thing. And that's why I, I do the same much. thing. I recede back into... Shit. Oh, that's all good. Sorry. I'll get a... Uh, Ashton, you know, that cut there. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, the I was I was on a holiday, my first one in ages, because I used to uh, freelance a shitload. This is at Us Depot Beach, Durris, North Durris. I'm camping there, right? I'm on my holiday, my camping holiday. The reason why I'm on this camping holiday is because I've taken a full-time job finally so I can have a paid holiday. And while I'm on that holiday, I find out that my writer, my creative partner, has been retrenched when he came back from his holiday. And so I'm on my holiday, four days into it, and I've gone, fuck, that fucked my holiday again. Some cunt that I work with has fucked my holiday. I've been talking to Adrian about finding a space, and it was at that point, I had a two weeks holiday. First week was camping, fantastic. The second week, I got in here, got this studio, painted it, put walls on it, put doors on it, did all that, so that I wasn't at the mercy of somebody else's whim, and that I had some sort of control. It actually hasn't worked out that way. But, um, but <laughs> the, the, the perception of control, right? Like, but, you, but, you just feel you're in control whether you are or you're not, just well, having the space. And I, I think an attempt at trying to create control is an interesting idea anyway. Mm. Like, is that why you get a job and work your guts out, try and kill yourself, literally. Yeah, for the to, autonomy that money provides us. But, yeah, for a regular way. And then it's that like, well, what's the time we're sacrificing for the money? It's But also, what are you sacrificing? There's, there's mm. no security in that. Mm. There's none. I feel, strangely enough, I feel more secure being freelance or unemployed. Because <laughs> unemployment is a full-time job, mm. right? You have to work hard to find work. And then get, like, it used to be weeks and months that used to be hired now it's like days mm. and then you back out can't link it up i think it's i charge a little bit more or whatever yeah i don't think i charge that much for what i get and the worth it is but i made a decision that i'm going to try and control my own destiny not mm. let someone else do it and I, i've always kind of unintel un in unintentionally unintentionally i'm not much with words. That's I could right. have drawn I've, it. I could have drawn that word yeah. unintentional. That's all right. I got the, <laughs> but I got like, the cheat codes for the dictionary thanks. stuff. Yes, yeah, so. I love that. But unintentionally, I've always been like that, and I've probably self-destructed many jobs for because my passion over overwhelms people. In my fight for um, better work and better book and a better creative product, I've probably burnt bridges. But I'm proud of what I've done, mm. and I really hope one day I will be really proud of the work that I produce. Uh, my art work without brief without anybody else's fiddling around in it without anyone else telling me what to do I want to write my own brief create my own thing and I want to produce something that I love firstly and hopefully other people get moved by it like the thing about music you get moved by it and I think we spoke about this the other day art is pretty ra rare when you look at something moves you yeah this is a this is kind of um there was a great discussion we had the other day about this because it's something that's really on my mind at the moment as i'm you know starting to write more music and um get away from the treachery of trying to pursue this perfect piece of art that will generate that same kind of response right does does that drive you on or does the that knowledge kind of um do you, want to know do you see it as empowering or as a challenge oh it's such a challenge but also i find the most moving things that i've seen you know like when you're on instagram it's pretty rare that people say, get moved fuck, or wow, or make a comment, do something. During the breakup, whilst it was terrible, emotionally, for all of us, like my whole family and me, I was able to put some of this stuff on paper, in drawings, in paintings, by escaping to the bush to try and get this healing. But one of the painting, uh, drawings, illustration kind of things that I did that seemed to affect a lot of people. And whilst I did it because of my relationship, um, it's that one with me carrying a big bag of sorrow. Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, ink drawing, yeah? Yeah, mm. ink, charcoal, and on, on just some, like I've got a big roll of paper just down there. And um, it's so freeing to, to get big, not to be controlled. Scale-wise, you mean? Oh, yeah. yeah. When I was doing that sorry thing, it was to get out my demons of saying sorry all the time. I said, sorry, 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 but the currency, mm. it has no currency anymore. And so it actually ends up a burden. And so when you end up deeper into that, that was how I was feeling about my breakup. I'd fucked it all up. All my sorries meant nothing. And I was going up this hill in the rain. It was like all these really obvious 
thing. Yeah. Like sadness. It just all hits at that one point. I call it the burden. I'll probably have it forever. Each time I wrote sorry on that piece of paper, I felt some of that burden lifting. Yeah, right. And you actually felt the words carried some meaning. I don't know. It just made me lighter. And every time I said it, I it lifted me a bit. Now, I don't feel so sorry about saying sorry all the time. <laughs> I, I, and also, you can apologise so much and carry all that shit around with you. But there is a time when you have to bl- just let it go. You can't change how people feel about you. And you can't change it by saying sorry. You actually just have to show it, you know? You have to show it. But I think that's something interesting there about the the changing value of semantics right the changing value of words oh yeah currency of words yeah the currency of words you know you say you know sorry doesn't mean anything anymore but there's so many terms out there that mean nothing and there's terms that are important to people of certain disciplines that now mean nothing say i struggled to classify myself as an artist early on because an artist implied i wasn't particularly specialized and then it was like, oh, I want to be a printmaker because that shows I'm good at that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that can be my thing. But then I was like, well, I don't want to be typecast into that. I guess I'm an artist now. Now I just tell people every fucking thing. Well, I open tonight. I'm a musician, artist, and writer. Those are my three things. Yeah. And I've got that. But the changing semantics of words, I, it's I, this... I, I say I think for a living. That's a good one, man. That's pretty good. And... <laughs> That's fucking true. I think for a living. Yeah, or... And if you think and put it... But you've got to do a bit. Mm. There's no point just thinking it. You actually have to action it. I could have talked about being an artist and being angry forever about not being one. Mm. And I'm not an artist yet, but I'm on my fucking mission. No, you're or, an artist. I'm a bullshit artist in lots of ways, but I'm trying really hard. And I think by being a bit hard on yourself, mm. maybe we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. You gotta push yourself. How do you fucking yeah. stop all that shit? Well, I Ambition, because think... you still want people to see it and respond. Mm. It's fucking. It's a yeah, this, this conflict of communication. This is kind of. This is kind of what I'm trying to ask you. Is because I feel like we're on the same page here, but I've very much come to my conclusions as an outsider looking in. Whereas you have come from a world of advertising and media, which is directly responsible for these words changing me. Once once they catch hold of certain terms, they become sort of buzzwords for ideas that are detached from there. I, I would love to talk about this because that burden of sorry, if we look at the word sorry, that became a burden. But when other people looked at it, they saw it as a Aboriginal sorry. Yeah, since Kevin with the speech, it's been a... Yeah, so what was interesting about that image was that um, it meant a more personal sorry to me, but when other people saw it, they saw Australia and an Aboriginal struggle and that we must say sorry. And I mean, I was on that march when 600, the biggest fucking protest ever, walked across the Harbour Bridge. I went to that with my... I, that. Hey? I was I was really young. Yeah, well, my daughter uh, was in the pram. My first daughter, Moya. She came with us, and Mercedes, and Derek, and Mars. But, like, the whole gang of us. And we, we th- I thought, oh, yeah. And I got on the train, and it was full of people, like, going there. It was the most emotive thing as a Australian, white Australian, that all these people cared about the future of mm. our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. Is that not so, what's so great about now, too? So it's, that's what I'm feeling now. Mm. That all is about sorry. Yeah, the semantics, that's what, yeah. I think, and, and, and in lots of ways, the, the connection is that big march was about sorry and nothing has changed. Mm. My burden of sack of sorries, I said sorry so many times about being a fuckwit, but nothing changed. So, sorry, should we stop saying sorry? Should we I just, we should. Should, should we just start doing? I think we should. We should. Is there another word for well, sorry that means, I'm gonna fucking, well, is it dory where you, you mix sorry and do? Yeah. Or dury, or something like that. I wish we could live. It, but are you, are you big on Cezanne? I kind of want to reshift this to I, talk more about this emotive content or the the more pure content that I'm speaking of. There's these paintings that Cezanne did of oh, Mont Saint Victoire. That's it. 
there's this is a classic example, right? Oh, wow. Um, where if you went and looked at the fucking thing from that spot and compared the two images, you would you would not see a resemblance. Oh, you really? Would say, well, looking at the photographs, you wouldn't. But my mentor in first year, Kim Spooner, always says to me, if you if you go to Mount Saint Victoire and are there amongst the trees looking at the mountain, but he's this... captured it the likeness perfectly on an emotive level at the time. On plein air or being in that space. Mm. That's the light at the time. That's why shadows and colour shifts. When you start watching the colours and tones, like you see it everywhere. When you're walking around town, it's fucking cool, mm. actually. I did that 15 paintings in 15 days. Yeah, which brings... Which fucking freaked me out. Mm. I almost died doing it. But I started to think like an artist, I think. Mm. And maybe by being super prolific, that's the only way you feel that energy. Because oh, yeah. it started freaking me out. It was actually like you were tripping, you know, when you see shifts in colour and change in light yeah. when you're so into watching it. Focused attention and then yeah, yeah you can normally, get a feel of the duration. Like. Normally we ignore all that stuff and that study I reckon is because the light was constantly changing and there's different times of day. Mm. But it, it, it does bring me into my next question, and I'll talk about the 15 Plain Air series shortly. I, I did notice in doing the background for today how far you'd really come in noticing light and noticing the fall of light. I noticed a, um, a painting you did not all that long ago, Freshwater Way, and there's, there's like a dune. The way you captured the darkness, the late day darkness, kind of cast over that dune. I, it was hard not to notice how much more detail you were kind of getting into into light, but okay, I want to know. That that yeah, I've got one on my phone. I can show I, you. But I really want to know because you know I know that little spot so well, Long Reef, because that's where I surf my guts out. Oh right, okay. So it's it's and autobiographically. I, very I love that place. imprinted. It was really great painting all that stuff. Oh fuck, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I gave that to Gov. Yeah, yeah, that's a fucking ripper. I don't feel as strongly about the image of that as I do with your. If you're just looking at the way you capture light, that's that was that's bang on, man. But um, see this bit. That's like normally you probably ignore that, but that's mm. where the lagoon often meets the yeah, sea. Yeah, joins up. And sometimes it opens. But that bit of the area is stained, like different coloured soil or, or silt from the yeah, lagoon. Yeah. So that's probably happened because I walked across that. So I surfed just off that, and that's why I painted that for my mate Paul Govers, Gov, and. It was for his 50th, I think. His sister, Mary Ann, rang me up and said, can you do a painting? And I went, I know just the angle of Long Reef Headland in the distance and the lagoon. We parked just up between the lagoon and the headland, but we walked across just there. And there's always a beautiful break off there. So my question is, what, what does plein air bring to your practice that the studio doesn't? Is it just capturing light? Are you, are you just looking at light or are you really thinking about place in other ways? What I love about that, all those ones that I really like, is they've all been done like within half an hour because it's right near the end of the light mm. or right at the beginning of the light and we have to get on the road. Or mm. strangely enough, there's always maybe a deadline, <laughs> it's, which is like something that I hate. I hate the deadline. But, I hate it too, but we, we need it as artists, don't we? But oh, wouldn't it be great if we didn't? Because yeah. then, <laughs> then we would be completely free. Yeah, then we'd be free, but then you know we like, wouldn't be human humans would we well what is does that make you a human deadline and if you didn't have that stress of a deadline i love that idea but, but nothing but would we, get done we all die that's the ultimate deadline we're so worried about those things because we're trying to defy our own fucking well, it does, deadline it does create some adrenaline yeah and we're made of chemicals and mm. that serotonin gets released when you gotta go for it mm. which oh, i love my serotonin but I look at that and I love it because of that diptych. And actually, that, all those little sketches, maybe not the bomb, <laughs> that was done in the studio. And so that was overworked and overthought mm. about and probably probably trying to make it more like a photograph. You actually can't trust your own mediation. Well, I can't because are... I'm an art director and mm. I've been corrupted by so many mediums. By the analysis. You've got to think about everything. Yeah. Like, And maybe that's why, with photography, it's all about the light. But what makes 
it even better, which is where art direction comes in, it's all about the crop. So and I've heard you say that a few times, and I think it's interesting that a painter is so in tune with but that's social art media direction. theory. And it's the art direction coming through. It is so it's interesting. And colour. Right? Mm. I can put together colour, which sometimes people can't. Or I know what's well, aesthetically... Think, but, like, it's an instinct thing. I know people that are amazing at it and designers that can do it. Amazing. But it's funny when you have to fucking mix it all up. Like, there's times when I've just tried to use the base paints from the tube and it never fucking works. Yeah. And I actually believe that by starting with blue, red, yellow and green, CMYK or whatever the fuck it is, the basic colours, you get a better result. When you mix your own colours. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you mix it up a That's bit. something they really do stress at NASA. Oh, well, yeah. Marie was showed us how to do it properly. And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh yeah, and you got to and you do the thing with the the opposites where you you mix the two colors. And oh, we mix it was only two the days, man. It wasn't oh, a year. I was, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I was just having flashbacks, eh? Hey? <laughs> but, yeah, the way she did it and put it in rows, like, mm. hot, light to dark, because normally I just... Oh, that, that fucks I mix me up, it man. on the fly. Yeah. I mean, you've seen my palettes. Hers are... It's amazing how people can be measured about ordered. that, isn't it? Oh, my God. I was like, wow, that's amazing. But mine was just, like, destroyed. Mm. And I actually love the palette for that reason. You can see the colours that you've done on the day. Mm. <laughs> I always enjoyed the palette more than the paintings when I Sometimes. was doing painting class. Yeah. Every time. You got I was always taking photos like, of my palettes. Yeah. There's people, uh, famous artists, with collections of their palettes. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I have seen a bit of that, actually, but... And some are ordered guys, and some are... I like that you took the step and made them into works because I'd, I'd love people to have... And your, your work actually made me think of this. I'd love for people to well, use just, waste material for you know palettes. What? It's and then sustainable. Every, yeah. day, yeah. every day's palette into another artwork. So I'll show you this. Because I reckon it's something. I'm going to play a record. What do you feel like that? Huh? Upbeat, downbeat. I don't know why I keep thinking oh, Moby. Moby? Wow, that's a... Or, no, maybe DJ Moby. Shadow. Oh, 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 oh. I quite like this driving rule thing. Or the people around you. You believe in reality. What's real? Maybe. I'm just fucking talking shit now. And this no, joint no, is not. great. <laughs> oh, good. No, it's, it's, it's funny because oh you... God. You might feel like a Talking crackpot bonus. spouting it, but you... I am. See, this is ideas. This is where you have these... Mm. Like, I haven't had one of these idea conversations before. But this is where you're... You've I got... normally talk about ideas like this mm. to a brief, like selling a beer or mm. a wine or something. And I will jam about right and wrong and what's right and mm. chucking the, something out that's left of field and, you know, while still being aware of the brief. But jamming and this... I, I love this free styling like mm. idea thing it's so fun mm. and having a bit of uh, banter and I've never had that like I, I have that with my creative partners like Robbie, but not, not without and, mediation and compromise to a degree um, actually uh, it all gets pretty loose when I'm around it seems <laughs> yeah I know that <laughs> Oh. I, I reckon anyone that has worked as my creative partner goes fucking and subject hell. to the chaos. Subject to the chaos, but also without throwing out lots of different ideas, mm. you wouldn't crack a better ad mm. idea, or you wouldn't without doing lots of paintings, you won't get the cracker, or know that number five was the cracker, or your first thought might have been the cracker, but it, after a hundred paintings or ideas, you'll know that first one was because you've done something about it, which is kind of like good segue into um, a kind of period I want to talk about which is your plein air series right your, um, I remember when you first started doing these and why did you start doing them too was it for a bit of extra cash I can't remember what was it the, um... you were trying to fill oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. some sort of void but it became something else it was it? It, it was It was actually I saw you pick up so much in such a short time and I thought he's given himself the uni experience that oh, right. I've been going through right, right. Like, do they do make you, you do that sort of stuff well no 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 but like oh, I'm going to have to read what I wrote so I remember the question what difference did it have in your practice to force yourself through a period of mandated working where you're not allowed to second guess or doubt yourself where you have to force yourself to build a more economical work ethic that 15 on plein airs 15 days before Christmas that was it Christmas yeah um, and 15% went to charity it was like one of those and so what happened was um, yeah freelance 
finance was drying up and I remember saying to Mercedes, I'm going to, like, I'd been doing some art. I think I think I had the studio by then. Yeah, I definitely Oh, did. you were yeah. in here, yeah. I was definitely in here. It was after I'd left and started. I said, fuck, I'm going to do this. Mercedes went, right, fuck. And I said, oh my God, this is going to be heavy. So I just put it on Facebook that I'm going to do a painting a day and auction them off every day so what was great was everyone got into it everyone was, on Facebook it was awesome man have Every, you seen the Facebook stuff it was it's like fucking like goes on for days it was so good to see because I, I knew you had the passion right when I saw the response you got there oh, man. at a stage where you're only just finding yourself as an artist My I friends, was like how good you've got this support behind you like this could work insane. man this and could work I must say Facebook and Instagram is really good for that positive push. Even um, on a more local sense, even not reaching global things, but... Well, yeah, like... Touching well, people you know. Now we know everybody around the world because you travel. I worked in London and Paris and Geneva and through living in both Geneva and Paris, I ended up in Moscow and Poland and Istanbul. I almost, just before COVID, I almost got a freelance gig in Warsaw through a guy I'd worked with 10 years ago that when... Oh, who, who, who's, yeah, just fucking random goes, mm. do you know anyone that would want to come to Poland and teach my team creativity and, and also be able to do global work? I went, yeah, me. And so we had this dialogue until COVID hit. I was going to go over there for a month or two or something and help out for a bit. Mm. It would have been fucking excellent. It's amazing what this COVID thing's done. It's fucking crazy. My, I see so many perspectives. Like, mm. I heard my 18-year-old daughter um, picked her up late from work the other day. And she's going, the HSC is fucked. My 18 is fucked. Is your daughter doing the HSC this year? Yeah, and she turned 18. She's just like, this sucks. And her parents broke up the year before. Oh, cool thing. But she's awesome. She's fucking... Yeah. You should see her artwork for her HSC. And you know what they're doing with this year with the HSC? They're not having an exhibition. How fucked is that? That is the ultimate kick in the face. They need to have that exhibition. Yeah. Maybe we, maybe I need to step up and it's... go and have a chat. Because these kids have been through a lot this year. And the creative people feel it more. They feel it. And that's creative. People. Mate, I had we the same that. thought this morning because my I I felt when I was in year twelve, we some of us put everything into that major work. That man. major, and you I, should bloody see. Her. I did it's music amazing. and art, and because everything's due before the trials even start. Yeah, yeah. Everything until the trials was art and music. So I didn't study anything else until the trials are after before. this holiday. Mm. And she's going. I said, oh, you're on school holidays, and she I've goes, never no, had this. Dad, <laughs> no fucking trials. I'm going. Oh fuck, because I don't live there. I'm not seeing it every day which I hate I would love to be switched on and in the know or talk to oh, it'll come in time I'm sure both daughters Moya's also doing it um, her little insta thing uh, by Moy Moy's is pretty good I like her illustrations I'm, I'm, I really like her work man Those I, still, girls I still think she'd be a great printmaker I, I really um, want her to go to the school whether it's you know whether it's screen you know printing or etching Just sounds good yeah I'll play a record oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might be staying here tonight. I feel like I'm pretty high. <laughs> hey, do you want me to put some of these in? Yeah, there should still be a few oh, there. Six there, do you want a beer? I'm still going. I'll chuck it in just in case. Actually, yeah, maybe just bring one anyway. Working. Okay. All right. We're fed. We're fed. We're watered. We're watered. Properly lubricated. So before we properly devolve into the night, let's talk about your trip because you know this is important for me to ask you, and I think it's important in conveying you as an artist. Firstly, who is Alec Dumaji? How did you meet? How did this project come about? Well, we ended up calling the whole project Painting Alec Dumaji. And it was what ended up being my mission ended up a bit of a collaboration in lots of ways because I couldn't have done it without my comrade in arms, Sean Izzard. I asked to document me and the journey to meet Alec Dumaji. And um, who is Alec Dumaji? Alec Dumaji, well, when I first saw Alec Dumaji, it was in a YouTube YouTube video he was with the I'll wait till you finished <laughs> that would have been imagine that that would have been so disrespectful shocking <laughs> all right let's back let's backtrack so I can edit no but <laughs> yeah yeah 
Who is Alec Dovici, you ask? No bong rip. Mm. Oh, man. That was so much, like, Cypress Hill. I was just getting myself dialed in so I could properly, like... <laughs> Like, who is Alec Dumaji? It's a pretty interesting way that I discovered Alec Dumaji. Um, I was looking at Welcome to Country, which is a, a website uh, with Indigenous issues, because I'm sort of starting on this journey to learn more about stuff. Anyway, they put up this video of the Wani warriors protesting for Lawn Hill. Then I read on, Lawn Hill has a really disgusting and horrible past where the colonists uh, nailed, I think it was 30 sets or 40... Oh, I've got to get that right. A lot, either way. 40 pairs of Aboriginal ears were nailed to the homestead wall. And then I read further, and the history is even more shocking, how those colonists treated the Wani people. When I saw the protest, I thought how calm, courageous and strong Alec was and his people. The way they protested were in something that could have got really emotional, and they took back 100% Wani. They took back their country. I'm not sure if it's legal or... Or, or if it, the protest was successful. But I posted that video on... I reckon we should put that video on here. I think it's really strong and poignant. And anyway, it was the catalyst for me to begin this weird journey to go meet him and paint him. I put it on Facebook, this video, and a friend of mine said he was sitting next to him the week before at a tourism conference. And so I said in the minute, hey, can you put me in touch with him? I want to paint him. And I'm not a portrait painter by any chance. It's obvious by the painting I ended up painting. But, you know, suddenly I'm on this 6,000 kilometre round trip up to the Gulf of Carpentaria to meet Alec, who I only ended up meeting for about an hour that whole time. Oh, really? Yeah, it was wow. only a small meet. Because he was busy uh, with his so festival. Stuff going on. Which was the Gulf Country oh, yeah, the... Frontier Days Festival. The longest name for a festival ever. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we we attended that in the hope that we would be able to talk to him because I knew he was a busy guy mm. and to pin him down would be near impossible and I thought this would be the place. So before, a week before I left Sydney, I asked Sean to come and I'm, I'm on the beeline from DY to the city the next day and he goes, yeah, I'm in. So he's on board and he made his own art from the journey. He made some incredible photos of the Aboriginal rodeo and also of the trip and also he made a film so <laughs> we both got so much out of it and it's amazing in a film done mm. by Sean Izzard he did it really beautifully and made me look half intelligent because some of the things we had and did on that trip weren't very smart <laughs> Yeah, there was lots of there was so much funniness that went on, but he chose this serious. Uh, it could have been a, a really funny comedy. We were talking about this, um, and you were saying it could have gone either way. But I can imagine that you know you're describing such spontaneity with and the energy. Um, so it's like, all right, let's do this. Let's go. We're oh man! To make something happened. We've got an opportunity to document this with people that document things. But that's and, other, that's other artists collaborating with you. That's, yeah, that's why think, it's so important to talk to people. I think having that kind of rawness in the immediacy of it, also not removing yourself from the humour, from it was a little bit from, you know from that side of life. I think it kind of would help give the more serious moments conviction and well, then, maybe a bit more integrity than someone that would be going out if that's trying to shoot a serious documentary. That's true. Well, the talent of Sean is he didn't really... He didn't have a storyboard. He didn't have a story. It was a documentary that he was watching unfold. Mm. We shot everything. And we had a, a microphone called Mr. Fluffy. <laughs> because you know how <laughs> the, microphones yeah, yeah, are really fluffy? fluffy. So we lost the fluffy bit at some stage. Oh, no. And so we put a glove over it. <laughs> his, his glove head. It, Mr. Fluffy went everywhere with us because Sean knew that I would say something stupid in the stupidest place. And so he was on me the whole time. So that's why he got some really good dialogue that mm. I wish hadn't ended up on the, um, on the, on the cutting floor. cutting room floor. Yeah. Funnily enough, it was only a recording that I ended up getting of Alec Dumaji. I didn't do a sketch on him. Right. I got, how weird's this, right? I waited all day for him and I only got one photo. My mobile phone battery ran out. Wow. I got one photo and then when I went back, the camera wouldn't work and so I did an interview with him. I've got that all on Mr. Fluffy. So you kind of had to so reconstruct I, a profile 
based on his voice and well yeah no I didn't actually listen to it again because Sean right. thought he'd lost the uh, recording right because he had all those mechanical problems yeah well, so we thought we'd lost um, that recording so I painted the painting based on my memories of what he said and even even the um, up the Bujumala National Park up the Lawn Hill Oasis I left my camera in the car <laughs> how fucked up is that it's like, just it, this like horrible yeah it was a whole bunch of things of I get this far I get this far up there and I don't have the tools that I thought I'd have to document it except my memory which isn't great from a misspent youth but um, all that I think actually benefited from not having any photographic reference do you think being forced to make up that distance between having that mm. it, it forced you to scrutinise it more look look a bit further into how you were constructing it I don't so know this tree right that's very different yeah Ale- your portrait but I don't Alec and- but I don't have I don't have a style yet because maybe because I'm an art director and, and have changed styles all the time maybe that's why I haven't got a style yet god they are all different aren't they yeah but there's there's a style in your drawn mark there's, yeah there's a bit a, flowy I like it yeah the flowiness and then the I, I really I've been really enjoying drawing it's interesting about the difference in this tree and Alec these are oh, I, yeah. I'd argue these are the, your two paintings I've seen that bring everything you've learnt to the table that I can look at and I can dissect bits that I've seen out of all the other different works you've oh, been yeah, doing yeah. Yeah, yeah. while this culminates a stream of plain air works this thing with Alec that was on my wall what, for ages yeah it just it not only speaks to the studio but this idea of reconstructing knowledge based on memory and like listening to instinct when you said yeah. so he, he told you just to dream it I have fucking cool is that because like I'm going wow he probably just said it but with the whole dream time and the storylines and all that sort of thing that you hear from what you know the very little you, you know you go I wonder if he meant that yeah well, I don't know this brings us back to semantics it's like well he said dreaming but in there he well, probably dreaming, just meant just a, well, it, just give it a crack mate as well it, could it have could been. Be a, can be a form of analysis though like I was saying in the way Aboriginal art cartography the way they perceive ecosystems aerially with such well it's funny detail. funny in this painting I haven't I don't think going fully above would be the right way because mm. that would be misappropriation then it's messy but without knowing it I've actually gone higher than the ridge and the perspective isn't true of what I saw when I got on top of that mountain so I've made up a lot of that vista but to bring in to perspective things that I saw like these beautiful sweeping plains flat as a tack but kind of like these ridges of waves like earth waves and you can see it and the, there wasn't any clouds but in this it feels like there is spots of cloud openings but I was learning how to do the trees just as a dot and a line like stuff like that and the ears are terrible and the feathers aren't great but I really like his head and I kind of like the concept that so back to the history and the reason why Alec Dumaji is a wedge tail eagle hovering above the Bujumala National Park and the Lawn Hill area is because he's protecting it I, I named the painting 100% Wani and that's what they were they were fighting for legally because of um, the land rights the land rights so because there's a long history and documented history from the ears on the homestead wall to you know the pastoralists and their cruel stuff so they went through court and they pastoralists got 49% and Wani people got 51% basically the there was a you know you had to show the books so both of you benefited in the production from the land, from the country. And, of course, the pastoralists weren't doing it, the Lawn Hill mob. And that's why they decided to protest and take back 100% of their land, which was stolen from them and it's documented. Oh, man, it was amazing. So proud. Anyway, he's a top bloke. Recently, we did a TV show thing. He's going to, I think it's going to be on NITV called The Frontier, about the festival. You get to see Sean's movie, uh, Painting Alec Dumaji, and that's all about me and my mission and it was funny he was such a task master master he's such a task master he was invested in it in the end i couldn't have done it if he wasn't there i would have run out of petrol halfway yeah right. no shit i would have like it's fucking just cost a bomb to drive that far mm. and sean was amazing anyway like just before sunset because um you had to drive all day like kind mm. of like eight hours a day just to, to cover the distance to cover this distance and because you had to stop before sunset because the route 
kangaroos come out down the highways it was like a cemetery of kangaroos it was just fucking chaos the reason being is because of the drought at the time the drought was you've seen the paintings how red it is how there's no foliage or anything and it was just red far as the eye can see really and just tiny bits of green it was really sad and there's actually one of the great paintings that I sold to Simon Harson, another photographer that works with Sean um, they've been working together as a collaborators for years but he bought the photo with the see the ruse popping up oh, no, ruse no, no. on the yeah, red yeah, dust yeah. it was like that you see the little puff of puff dust of coming up yeah, yeah it was that dry then they dance off I say dance you say hop <laughs> whatever yeah I confess to you before that, you know, I feel in, in the wake of these protests, it was a very raw introspection to find that maybe it's not good enough just to have your head in the right place and Ollie, maybe you need to get out in the world and do a bit more, be more community minded and get in the game. But oh, yeah. there's, there's a reason why I didn't and being ethically sound is part of it. I'm sure there's plenty of people who are now reinvigorated towards things like racial injustice and, you know, bigger humanitarian problems, but they just don't know how to appropriately be a part of that conversation without disturbing what is now a precarious kind of PC climate in 2020. Yeah. So my question is what precautionary sensitivities or lessons have you learned or been taught in dealing with Aboriginality in your practice as a Caucasian male? Is yeah, there... yeah, because I'm really conscious of I'd, it. I'd love to hear any insights you have on that. Yeah, I'm really cautious of straying into misappropriation. And I, I actually hope that I haven't, but it would be only through ignorance that I have, you know, mm. because I've tried to think about it from all perspectives. And I think um, what I tried to do, I, I've seen this proud person do an amazing thing in the protest and I've used some of the the spiritual things like his totem was the black cockatoo re- uh, with a red tail you know mm-hmm. red tail black cockatoo and his elders gave him a special title Jarabikala right I think Jarabikala or Jarabikala mate I, like I said my languages are terrible especially my Mwani basically the, he was became a uh, wedge tail eagle was the symbol, symbolism of that he has explained it to me and I I think to do it justice we need to I need to make make sure we say it properly so we'll have to do this another time yeah we can revisit it sure. yeah. yeah that's something that happened in Sean's video we had to go back and revoice some of it because I got I thought it would be insulting oh, really? you had to redub yeah. bits because you felt well, it's it an, was it, yeah. it was a narrative and I said it wrong and you have to really respect that you've done the right thing by pronouncing the words right I think that's an interesting tidbit in itself isn't it just going back over things and making sure yeah you cover things like that I, I saw an Asian actor recently um, he said he had to pull up the guys that were running on the show and said look you know the dad to my character speaks a different dialect of Chinese yeah and I don't think it's a problem but I know yeah. it can cause problems because people will pick up on it yeah it's um, like um, New Zealand Australian accents mm. oh you're you're assy no I'm New Zealand you <laughs> can't yeah. they hate it they yeah. hate it they get called I mean, Aussies all the time. I don't blame them I wouldn't want to be associated with us if I was them yeah so, well now you seem to add that. It's amazing. Oh, I know, right? Uh, what a woman. Yeah. Hot. <laughs> Smart, lots of empathy, clever, fucking amazing person. I've, um, yeah, I don't think I've ever had... The a, for a, a politician? Yeah, not only that, but just... Or admiration. Admiration, yeah. I've never More had admiration that. admiration than anything, you know. I mean, Bob Brown, amazing. Even um, the previous woman prime minister, Helen Clark, did some amazing things. Yeah, I was little when she was... Yeah. Julia Gillard. Well, like, what are we doing with this fucking dumb, smug cunt smiling at us? I hate him. I hate them all. Well, they got like two women in there. So this is the learning. I've had the benefit of why I've got to step back a bit, which is the perfect time in my life to do it. And things I've learned not to in the protests or in showing shining light on something like Black Lives Matter. It's not about me at all. It's about that story. And also, there's no way I can understand what it's like to be black. Like, there's no way I could ever understand that. So I have yeah. to understand that. Yeah, so you definitely, you can't so, let it be an act of virtue signalling. Yeah, like... A term I, I've heard recently. Yeah, there's so many ways to get it wrong. Mm. So you just got to step back. And it's like in the breakup, I learned all the things that I said that were wrong. And I have to think about what you say and how you think. It's just the thing you got to do now. You definitely affirm to 
people out there it's better to be a part of the conversation and be wrong than to withhold yourself from the fear of being wrong you have to um discover where you've been wrong before like lots of people find out that they were wrong and they go no it wasn't mm. but it gets them to that point where they're uncomfortable yeah yeah well i i've been constantly uncomfortable because of all the things i've done wrong without knowing it and now i gotta change that by changing how i behave what i say and think about it so that everyone around me starts making be doing it because if you start doing it people will notice if you think you know what you're doing but I'm always learning about what's wrong and I keep constantly doing things wrong so I'm if you see me doing something wrong fucking tell me yeah and tell if you see someone doing something wrong maybe their friends just fucking tell them because probably not doing it deliberately and if they are they're not your friend <laughs> Yeah, no sure word said. Yeah, keep that in there. Man, but that's, I mean, I mean, that's what I love about you, man. I'll, I'll wrap that case in point there, but you're such a humble dude, and... I, I, I'm, I'm loving meeting people like you, because, like, you're, like, you've known that you're going to be an artist from early on. I don't know this yet. I'm, like, on that mission. It's so nice, to be honest. Finally. It's... it's... It's Without a you know monetary thing, it's the unlearning that I got to do. Mm, nice throwback. I like yeah, that. circle. Um, History is know, circular. It's, it's great to be a part of it. You know, I really love your humility because you're the first to admit that you feel like you don't know what you're doing. But what I think I've learned going through the academic system and realizing how kind of mutable my head is is no matter how much I learn on a particular subject, be it astrophysics or music, which I've known my entire life, I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I, I think, think it's a human thing. It's a human thing. And I think it's natural for you to feel that way. And I hope you don't always feel that way, but something in me suspects that it's really good for your work and your progress that you remain humble in that way and you keep Maintaining integrity to the process like you do and not compromising that. Well, I've compromised a lot already. Yeah. I already, I compromise, of course. Everyone does. But I'm trying to get rid of all that stuff. And I, I'm actually, I can't wait to see what happens mm. next. Because I don't think it should always just be painting. I don't, mm. as artists, it's film photo- photos, it's what you put on your Instagram, it's like everything. I mean, I don't just deliberately curate, but I definitely take a good photo and crop it the right way. And also surround yourself with people that enjoy art, want to make it, want to make it better, want to work with you, want to talk to you, talk about shit. Like, this is my first podcast, I think. Yeah, so. Me too. Yeah. Woo! Fucking popped our cherry together. <laughs> Yours was louder than mine. Yeah, well, my cherry's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> on that note. Yeah, on that note, I can cut the cord. Yeah, thanks, man. That was good. Thank you so much. It means God. a lot that you took the time out. Now your edit is going to be massive. Yeah, now I'll do the edit. I mean, it's, I deliberately... You can do little sound bites.